Good morning, everyone. There we go. See, that's good. I like that. (laughs) Do keep your Bibles open uh, at page uh, 206. Let me pray before we kick off. Father, thank you that uh, we can enjoy your presence together. Lord, we praise you that that isn't just uh, something that touches our hearts, but that you speak to us. We can hear what you have to say to us. And we pray this morning that uh, as your spirit reveals new things to us, may you renew our minds and touch our hearts and change our lives for your glory. Amen. Amen. I am excited. Are you feeling excited? We're in a new series this morning. You may have noticed we are in the Old Testament. Ooh, we haven't been in the Old Testament for a little while. We are in a series called Moving In, uh, which is uh, going through the first half of the book of Joshua as the people of Israel uh, cross the Jordan and enter into the promised land. And uh, this morning, we're looking at Joshua 1, which is the, the beginning of the next generation. But before we get there, uh, and because we, we're not in there that often, I wanted just to begin with a little uh, introduction, if you like, to the Old Testament. How do we read uh, the Old Testament? Because I think for many of us, the Old Testament is something that's rather opaque, rather alien, uh, difficult to read. And when we do read it, we find ourselves thinking, what on earth has this got to do with my life today? What on earth is God saying to me through this very strange passage? Well, I think the first thing I want to say is that uh, I believe passionately that the Old Testament does speak to us today. So these historical realities that we will be reading about, they do point to spiritual truth that's relevant for every one of us. The New Testament says that. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, uh, says to them, these things, i.e. the Old Testament, happened to them, the Israelites, as examples and were written down as warnings for us. So when we're reading the Old Testament, we're we're looking for God to say something to us as Christians still today. That's really important. But I think there are three key themes that I just want to flag up that I think will not only kind of help us understand a little bit more what's going on in Joshua, but actually will help us understand what's going on throughout the whole of the Old Testament. The first of those themes is covenant. The Old Testament is all about covenant. That's our relationship with God and his faithfulness to us as his people. God enters into relationship with us, and it's that relationship that gives us a sense of identity, an understanding of who we are. That's one theme that you need to be looking out for all the time. The second is kingdom. Because the Old Testament is all about God's reign and rule breaking into the world. It begins with uh, God's call of Abraham and then uh, the creation of Israel and on into the New Testament. And that's about not our identity, but our calling. What's our vocation? What is it that as God's people we are to do? So there's covenant and there's kingdom. And the third theme is Christ. On every page, in every sentence, look for Jesus. Look for Jesus. You remember at the end of Luke's gospel, uh, the resurrected Jesus is on the road to Emmaus and he meets two disciples. And they're feeling depressed because uh, they thought that uh, Jesus was the Messiah, but he'd been executed, so obviously he wasn't. And Jesus says to them, oh, you know, I need to explain something to you. And he opens the Old Testament to them. The Old Testament. And this is what Luke records. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, so exactly where we are this morning, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So when you're reading the Old Testament, look for covenant, look for kingdom, and look for Christ. But what about Joshua? Before we get into the meat of chapter 1, what about Joshua as a whole? Well, we don't know very much about the book of Joshua. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know when it was written. But we can say something at this stage about the plot as a whole. Because what you can see in the book of Joshua is the fulfillment of God's covenant that he made with Moses. He promised Moses that he would bring him into the promised land. 
and give that land to Israel. And that's what we see happening. So we see God is establishing his kingdom, the land here in this book. And that kingdom is breaking in through judgment. It's the judgment of the Canaanites, and Israel are the agents of that judgment. So you can see already kingdom and covenant, and you can see Christ too. The name Jesus means the Lord saves, and it's the same as the Hebrew word Joshua. So whenever you see Joshua, who's described in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament as this great hero of faith, who had enough faith to march around the walls of Jericho and see that city collapse, When we see Joshua and we read about Joshua, think Jesus. What's God saying to us about Jesus? Because this conquest story is all part of God's salvation history. But why are we looking at it today? We've thought about the Old Testament as a whole. We've thought about uh, the book of Joshua as a whole. But what about us? Why are we here now in August 2012 looking at the book of Joshua? We're calling the series Moving In, and that's because it's a story of change and transition. It's a story of of changing in terms of who we are and what God is doing. What God is doing in our lives as he changes our hearts, as he changes us as individuals. But it's also a story of of change in what we are a part of. That's St. Paul Shadwell. Joshua is a story of the people of God moving from one level of life to another, one season to another, from what was to what is. It's a story of reinvention, of reimagination. And change can, at best for us, be unsettling, can't it? But at worst, it can be traumatic. And so, for us, the temptation is to rest. It's to resist the call to cross the Jordan and enjoy the bank east of the river. And we simply stare at the river and think, I am not going anywhere near it. Thank you very much. But the call of Joshua is to break through, it's to cross over, it's to move into the land. And you know, now it is our turn. This is our moment. You remember at the opening ceremony of the the Olympics, you had that moving moment right at the end where Sir Steve Redgrave brings in the torch and we're all thinking he's going to be the one that lights the cauldron. But of course he wasn't, was he? He handed it over to four torchbearers, four young men and women, completely unknown. He handed it on to the next generation. And the story of Joshua is a story of legacy. It's a story of the next generation. And we, you and me, we are the next generation. And the question that is posed to us in Joshua 1 is, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you prepared Change is coming. And Joshua 1 says, get ready. And I think there are four steps for us to look at this morning as we prepare to be the next generation. We are to step away, we're to step up, we're to step out, and we're to step together. You with me? Brilliant. Let's start with the first one. Step away. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. We're to step away. The first thing we're to do to be the next generation is we're to let go of the past. Moses is dead. The great leader is gone. He was Israel's mediator. Israel had rebelled against God. They were about to be judged. He was the only one in covenant relationship with God. And yet he chooses not to turn away from them and say, I know they're beyond the pale. He chooses to intercede on their behalf and to stand with them against God. And to pray for them and stand with them and tie his destiny to theirs. He's more than a prophet. This is the one who saw God and lived. He's incomparable. There's no one like Moses, but now Moses is gone. And Joshua, he's got to let him go. And the truth is, for every one of us, change hurts. 
Change first means leaving what was behind. Death comes before resurrection as thunder follows lightning. It's always that way. And so to embrace the future, we've got to let go of the past. To receive something new, we've got to let go of something old. That's the truth of what Jesus is saying in John's Gospel, chapter 12, where he says, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. You see, Moses was awesome, but he's dead. And so Joshua's got to leave the past behind. He's got to realize it's his turn. And we have to realize it's our turn. This is our day. We are the next generation. So step away from the past. Let go of the past. And instead, step up. Look at verse 5. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Step up. Step into God's promise. Press into God's promise. Moses is dead, but there's a river to cross. There's a land to conquer. It's Joshua's turn. It's his moment. It's his time. Is he going to step up? Is he up to the task? Is he going to do it? Well, not through his own effort. Not through his own determination and gritted teeth, but through the promise of God. And God promises Joshua two things. Firstly, he promises Joshua his presence. You see, it's the presence of God that made Moses great. And Moses, he's gone, but the presence of God, it remains. And it's the presence of God that will make Joshua great too. It's the presence of God that makes all the difference. It's the presence of God that assures Joshua that he is loved. It's the presence of God that affirms him that he is walking with God and doing the right thing, even when everyone else is telling him that isn't so. The presence of God, it is enough for every one of us. So press into the presence. God promises his presence. But he also promises an inheritance. Look at verse 4. God promises Joshua the land. And then he goes on to describe the land and what a land it is. The borders of the land are huge. It's an extraordinary promise. There is nothing like God's inheritance. There is nothing like God's future. Nothing compares to it. The inheritance is far greater than the obstacle. The land is amazing, and when you look at the land beyond the river, you realize the river is just a muddy trickle. And that land, that inheritance, is a gift from God. God promises Joshua he will take it. He guarantees his success wherever he puts his foot. And so crossing that river is worth it. Because what is ahead is much better than what is behind The past, it was great. There were some extraordinary moments with Moses. But the future will be greater still. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? So step away, let go of the past. Step up, press into God's promise. And thirdly, step out. Verse 7, famous words. Be strong and very courageous. Step out, says God. Risk everything. Moses is dead. The past is gone. God's promise, though, remains. But God's promise always has a purpose. You see, Joshua has a mission. He has a task. He has been given by God a calling. He has something to live his life for, something to devote himself to, something to dedicate all that he is to, to sacrifice himself for, to give He's everything to. But often we find that it, that frightens us, don't we? So the promise of God's presence and his inheritance is welcomed. That's something we want. But God's purpose in our lives is feared. But the Old Testament makes very clear that God's promise and his purpose, they always go together. 
You cannot have one without the other. And that means here, God says to Moses two very important things. The first thing he does is he dismisses discouragement. Verse 9, the second half of verse 9. Even if the purpose that he gives you seems overwhelming and impossible, unthinkable, just too much to embrace, too much to imagine, God says there's no room for fear, only faith. One writer describes discouragement as the leukemia of the soul. Just as leukemia attacks uh, the blood that gives us life, so discouragement attacks our life-giving passions, our calling. So God tells us to dismiss discouragement. And instead, he commands us to be courageous. You see how the promise of God is followed by an instruction here, an exhortation, a command. And to achieve his purpose, God says you must be courageous. Joshua needs this adventurous spirit. He needs to be tenacious and determined. He needs to be reckless and fearless. He needs to have audacious faith. But where is that faith going to come from? Where's it going to come from? Is he going to have to dredge it up from within his own heart, his own soul? Well, what we see here is that courage comes from constancy. You see, this movement of promise and purpose, Joshua has seen it all before. He's seen it in Abraham, where God promises him And then gives him a purpose. He's seen it in Isaac, in Jacob, in Joseph. Of course, he's seen it in Moses. And he has seen that God keeps his promises again and again and again. And we see his purposes fulfilled time and again. And that's precisely why God says to him, be courageous. And to do that, you need to know the book. Have the book on your lips. Recite it day and night. Meditate on it. Get it down into your heart. Do what it says. Put it into practice. You see, the Bible, it's not a rule book. It's not a book of advice. It is a story of God's covenant with his people. It is a story of God's promise to us and his purpose working out through us. It is a story of covenant and kingdom. And so the Bible says to Joshua, and it says to us, God is reliable. He is faithful. You can trust him. He is uh, constant. You can have an audacious faith. You can be brave and courageous. Others have before us, and God has never let them down. What he's saying to us is, if you're in it, you have it. He won't ask you to do something without equipping you to do it. So join in with what God has been doing for generations. But to do that, you have to know the book. You have to trust the book. You have to do the book. And so take up Rich's offer and join Urban Impact You don't have to give up work in that year. You can uh, just say, this year I'm going to focus on my own discipleship. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. I'm going to dedicate Thursday evenings to uh, growing deeper in Christ. I'm going to spend once a month at the School of Theology and dig into Scripture. It's our Bible track this year. What a great time to do that. So step away, let go of the past, step up, press into God's presence, and step out, risk everything, pursue his purpose. And then fourthly, step together. Look at verse 16. Whatever you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. So Joshua here is saying, step together, trust everyone. The past is gone. The presence remains. We've got a purpose to pursue. And to do that, we need to pool our resources together. We are in this together. Do you notice how much unity matters in this first chapter of Joshua? It is uh, perhaps the most significant 
thing that the writer wants us to grasp. And that's, we only really understand that when we recognize that uh, the people of Israel, their history almost came to an end. Certainly in, Mos- in the mind of Moses. In Numbers 32, these two and a half tribes, they get to the river and they look at the river and they look over their shoulders and they think to themselves, wow, this land's quite nice. I can't really see across the river. God says that's the promised land. But actually, this is quite comfortable. I think I'm just going to sit here. And they say to Moses, Moses, we've decided, these two and a half tribes, that uh, this will do us. Is that all right? You guys, if you still want to go and cross the river and conquer that land and take on those incredibly scary Canaanites, you do that. But we, we're happy and content where we are. Thank you. And Moses loses his rag. Because he sees that this disunity could break the people of God completely. And so he promises judgment. There will be another Kadesh Barnea where the people of God were swallowed up as God's judgment came upon them. And the tribes in terror promised that even though they will stay in this land, they would go and help. Their fighting men would fight with the other tribes and help them take the promised land. And Moses said, okay, that's fine. But we need to remember there's no opt-out clause in the people of God. There's no opt-out clause in the church, whether that's for us as individuals or for us as a church. There is no opt-out clause. And that means that all of us have something to give you notice, God makes a promise here to Joshua as an individual in verses 1 to 4. But he also makes a promise to his people in, chapter, in verses 5 to 9. He makes a promise to you and to me that he will be with us, that we are to take the land, that we are to be strong and courageous. And Joshua's response in verse 10 is to mobilize the people. Do you see what happens? Everybody gets ready. So in this scene, what's your role? What's your role? How are you playing your part? How are you serving this morning? If you are not on any team, I want to encourage you this morning, before you leave, to sign one of those join a team cards and join the hospitality and welcome team. That's all you need to do. It's the most enjoyable job in the church. And in this service, we need you. So join the welcome team. Say hello to people on the door. Make them feel like they're coming home for the first time. You see, in the church, we have a movement into the life of St. Paul's. We begin with explore, and you do that maybe by coming on the Alpha course, or you do that by uh, attending a Sunday service. But then you move from explore to belong, and you join a connect group where you find community, and you build relationships, and you make friendships together. But you don't stay in belong. You then move to serve. You join a team. You use the gifts God's given you to bless the church together as a family. And then you move from serve to learn. As you think, I want to grow in my discipleship. I'm going to go on the marriage course. I'm going to go on the marriage preparation course. I'm going to go on the school of theology. And then you move from learn to give. That last conversion that Luther spoke about, the conversion of the wallet. And as we've gone through that journey, we find that we are preparing ourselves as the next generation. We are moving along. We're moving into the church. So we all have something to give, but we all have someone to help. Do you notice how Joshua delegates to his officers, verse 10, and it's the officers, not Joshua, that go through the camp. The, these two and a half tribes, they commit themselves to Joshua. They say, yes, we have a part to play. We may have settled for less east of the Jordan, but we are committed to more. What you say we will do. What, where you send us, we will go. So who are you committed to? 
this morning? Who are you helping? Who are you investing in? I said last week that you'll be hearing a lot about this idea of, of apprenticing one another, of being someone's coach and being coached by someone else. And I want all of you to be in that place where you're in the middle of two other relationships, someone you are coaching and someone who is coaching you. That's how discipleship works. That's why Joshua was discipled by Moses, why Joshua disciples his officers and sends them to do his work for him. So we all have someone, something to give. We all have someone to help. So step away, let go of the past, step up, press into God's presence, step out, risk everything, pursue his purpose for your life, and then step together. Trust everyone. Pool your resources. You see, just to wrap up, change is inevitable. We live in a fast-moving world. What is God changing in your life today, this morning, right now? Where are you moving from one level of life to another, one season to another? Where are you moving from what was to what is? And are you ready for that change that God is working out in your life? And change is happening all around us. We are becoming the church of tomorrow. Invite 2012 has changed our culture. We have seen new disciples made. We have seen salvation take place. We've seen transformation occur. We've seen new members join the church. In January 2013... We're planting into St. Luke's Millwall. Are we ready for the change that that will bring? As we continue to reinvent and reimagine ourselves. The temptation will be to rest and to resist, but the call of Joshua is to break through, to cross over, to move in, and it is now our turn. It is now our moment. So are you ready? And that's when you yell back at me, yes, we are. Amen. Let me pray.